Hi everyone, and welcome to the Illustration Department Podcast. My name is Giuseppe Castellano. In this podcast, I talk to folks in illustration, graphic design, publishing, animation, and other creative fields about their beginnings, their successes, and the bumps and bruises they've experienced along the way. In this episode, my guest is award-winning illustrator, satirist, and visual reporter, Victor Juhas. There are so many illustrators whose careers are intertwined with the military. E.H. Shepard, Bill Keen, Ashley Bryan, Linda Kitson, and Victor. Among other topics, we look back on what it was like working, quote, in the old school as an illustrator in the 1970s. Victor shares what it was like being an artist embedded with U.S. troops. And we talk about knowing when an illustration is finished, when it's time to throw it away, and when it's time to start over. I hope you enjoy our conversation. We've actually crossed paths, but we've never been introduced. We never talked, I don't think. Um, I hung around the Society of Illustrators a lot. And, you know, your face is definitely familiar. Like, you were definitely there while I was there. Were you there, like, at receptions and such? Yeah. Receptions, oh, okay, open okay. drawing, that kind of thing. Oh, open drawing? Seriously? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry we didn't get to meet each other there. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. You didn't, you're, not, you're not missing much. Oh. So I, I want to start in 1974, if you don't mind. Yes. You were a year away from graduating from Parsons, and you received a commission from the New York Times of all places. Um, you said the Times was the goal for editorial illustrators at the time. You started first at the top, and you were thinking, well, what the hell do I do now? So – what led to that commission? What I mean, what, were you a late? Were you a junior or an early senior? Uh, I was. Uh, I took the three years at Parsons. I did not go for a BFA. Um, okay. I felt like I just. I, I was a blue collar kid, so I thought to myself, I, I'm just as well off going for uh, the education and what I'm, uh, what I want to be, right. as a, as opposed to g- going for a degree. Okay. Uh, in, in one sense or another, we could speculate whether that was a smart decision or not. But uh, <laughs> I was in my second year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd say one of the advantages, one of the huge advantages of going to a school like Parsons back then, and maybe it still applies now, but certainly uh, going to a, 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 a prestigious art school like Parsons or School of Visual Arts or something, you were working with the with the top pros at the mm-hmm. time. You know, you were sure. not – we were not dealing with uh, a lot of uh, <clears throat> academics and um, people who had wonderful degrees after their names. We were dealing with uh, the, the instructors whose degrees were uh, the reality of, of being illustrators. Yeah. I'd say many of them were probably fortunate to have gotten through high school. And uh, what they had to impart was the experience of of uh, being top pros. Sure. Pe- people like uh, Bernie DeAndrea, people like Murray Tinkleman, yep. uh, Jim Spanfeller, and John Gundelfinger. I mean, uh, I could uh, I'm going to forget so many other names. Sure. Lorraine Bernie's uh, Bernie's late wife, uh, uh, Lorraine Fox. Mm-hmm. I mean, these uh, uh, they, these people were all there. I actually spoke with Joe Chardello on the podcast a couple episodes ago, and he uh, mentioned Jim, Jim Spanfeller as a huge influence on his career. Yes, yes. And these were people that uh, they were top of their field, and yet at the same time, absolutely accessible. They were teaching because I think they really enjoyed teaching, and they enjoyed interacting with the students. Right. So one of the things that comes out of this is that uh, you start showing – indications of promise and so and murray was aware of uh, the sketchings that i was doing mm-hmm. uh the scribblings the ideas uh, there weren't that many students when i was at parsons that were uh, uh, interested in politics per se mm-hmm. but i i kind of was following the politics i i think i grew up something of a uh class b political junkie at the t- at that time mm-hmm. and uh 
this is how weird I was as a little kid. I mean, I I used to pretend I was Walter Cronkite or Chet Huntley uh, on election night, and I'd have like this phony baloney microphone in front of me, and would be calling out the results from from the uh, that night's election along with them. And, and uh, I, <laughs> sometimes I'd set it up with my brother, so we'd be bantering back and forth. Nice. But um, nice. But anyway. I was doing that kind of work, and Murray was aware of it. And Murray uh, said, well, why don't you go upstairs and, and show this work to J.C. Suarez? Now, Suarez at that time had been the art director uh, and um, mm -hmm. one of the co-originators co, uh, of the op-ed page uh, mm -hmm. uh, illustration, sure. you know? And, yeah. and um, he had... He had left that post and he had passed it on to George Del Merico. Mm -hmm. And so I went upstairs and I, I showed the work to uh, JC and he was chewing on a cigar as, as t usual and was flipping through him. And he, he said, okay, fine. Yeah, go go see George. Go tell George I, I, uh, I sent you. Yeah. So I, I uh, c uh, called George Del Merico up and he said, come on over. And I came over there and there was George in this office and there was Lou Silverstein who showed up and – they were like uh, sifting through all, all my sketches. And uh, George said, oh, it's really cool. It's really cool. And then he was like, uh, and he pulls out this this, uh, this sheet of copy. And he said, uh, this is supposed to be tomorrow's uh, op-ed, one of the op-eds. And uh, what do, you, do you think you can do anything with this? And I, and I looked at it. I read it, uh, read it through a couple of times. And I kind of threw out an idea to him. And mm -hmm. uh, I had nothing with me at the time. I don't think I had more than a reprintograph with me. But... Back then, in the old school, uh, people actually had uh, art departments or even editorial departments uh, had uh, pens and, and, sure. and whiteout and, and inks and all sorts of stuff. So I did the job right there yep. in the office. Yep. And the next thing I uh, the next day, I, I go to pick up uh, the newspaper as I was heading over to my part time job as working in a steel factory in Garwood, New Jersey, a steel cutting factory. Mm -hmm. And uh, I pick it up and I look at it in the paper and I'm like, wow, this really ran. <laughs> and it's true. My next response was like, oh, shit. Oh, oh shit. Uh, this is supposed to be where you're heading toward. Now I just started here. Mm -hmm. And it was it was actually kind of a bummer. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I said, now what do I do? Right. You know, what's interesting is uh, George Del Merico uh, came up in a conversation I had with Stephen Kroeninger uh, way back in the beginning of this podcast um, life. And he, S Stephen, kept and to this day still has a rejection letter from George. And it was one of the greatest rejection letters of all time. You know, it was just one of those like, not yet, kid, but keep sending me stuff. Keep doing work. Keep, you know keep at it you'll get it and uh yeah steven read it on uh, in the episode and it was amazing yeah i wonder how many of us i'm sure i have some of those rejection letters somewhere the, uh, the ones you didn't burn in effigy no i didn't i never burned anything as a matter of fact i kind of I'm, I'm sure that i stored them somewhere maybe some sometime long after i'm dead and they they're sifting through all the files <laughs> that i i have yet to to re-examine, yeah. um, they'll come across those letters. Uh, yeah. Those mm, not yet, not yet. Right. Thanks, thanks for showing, but mm, not yet. Exactly. But um, uh, yeah, George, George was cool. George was cool, and so of, of course that ran. And then I started doing work during the summer uh, for the Times. And mm -hmm. by the time I started third year at Parsons, I had already had a few uh, illustrations under my belt to, yeah. to add to a portfolio. Amazing. Um, thanks to a high school teacher, I'm talking to Victor, the illustrator and not Victor, the truck driver. Um, that's, that's for another podcast I host. It's called, uh, it's about truck driving and it's called ears on the road. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you, you said you didn't apply anywhere. So you were in high school and you just didn't apply to anything beyond high school. Why not? Well, uh, there's a couple good reasons. One, I was... Uh, a very blue collar, mm -hmm. uh, from a, in a very uh, blue collar neighborhood. Is this Newark? No, this is uh, Roselle, New Jersey. Okay, and which is uh, right below Elizabeth, which is right below Newark, and next door to Linden. And um, B, uh, my folks, I was first generation. My folks were immigrants. 
with really limited grasp on how to work the system so sure. that I'm, I'm a senior in high school and I'm thinking I'm either going to work in a factory like my dad or, or, uh, or I'll be a, a truck. I had this fantasy about being a truck driver, uh, a long distance truck driver, like coast to coast. I thought it was something really cool about that. Uh, I'm so glad that didn't happen. Was there some so, element of like getting away from where you were? Oh, probably. Do you think that was the feeling? Sure. Yeah. Sure. In one sense, you were getting away. In another sense, you were carrying on the uh, the tradition of being uh, uh, that that blue collar grunt. Sure. But um, my uh, high school uh, art instructor, Nick Florio, who himself is a graduate from uh, Ducre in in uh, New Jersey, and um, he asked me one day, uh, "So, what are you going to be doing?" Because he, you know, I, I did a lot of things in his class and mm -hmm. I was doing the, uh, the, the drawings for the school newspaper and other things mm -hmm. that were happening at, at the high school. Mm -hmm. And I was part of the drama club. So I was there, you know, uh, creating backdrops for stages. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that and too anyway, in high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Nick was like, uh, so what are you going to be doing? I said, uh, I think I'll be driving a truck. And Nick just gave me this look well before we ever concocted the term um, eye roll and he just was like wow he goes come with, come with me okay. and and uh, he took me down to the office and he started pulling out these sheets of, uh, of applications and he goes you're gonna sit down you're gonna, we're gonna pick out some schools you're gonna send some applications it's not too late but you get you're, you're really kind of tight and what I, I filled out I think like four or five, I think I sent one to RISD. I definitely sent one to some uh, art school in, in, in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. um, I sent one to SVA, I'm sure. I sent one to Parsons. And, and also there was, uh, oh God, I just blanked on, 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 the, um, on another school that was in, in, in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, an art school. Hmm. Anyway, I uh, got rejections, and then but but Parsons was willing to see me, and I went there and I brought my portfolio, which I still have a fair amount of those pieces, uh, and um, I can't believe that they even said, "Yeah, you're you're perfect <laughs> for Parsons." Yeah. But the next thing I know, I, I get it accepted, and the, the the rest is the rest is history. Sure. But it it really accentuates the point of, of the importance of having a mentor, sure. of having a teacher uh, who cares about uh, your future. Right. And I think all of us, regardless of how successful we are, all of us can cl uh, claim at the very minimum one important mentor mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, who set us on a path, right? you know, or corrected our course. Yep. You know, Actually, speaking of that, so doing some research for this episode, by the way, sort of as a side note, I learned that, um, is it pronounced Yuhas? Yeah, Yuhas. Knock off the J, knock off the Z. All right, well, so Yuhas um, means shepherd in Hungarian. So did your parents come from Hungary? Yeah, uh, my father uh, did. My mother originally was from Hungary, but after World War II... She, uh, after World War II, she spent uh, three years in uh, the Soviet concentration camps, uh, being of German uh, background. Right. And uh, her much much of her family was was brought back to the Ukraine to work in the the, uh, the concentration camps there to rebuild the, the, the Soviet Union. Gotcha. And uh, my father's family also lost just about everything, um, uh, but. Uh, but my mother's family had to relocate to Germany because they were, were of German uh, sure. last name, Stifler. Gotcha. And, and um, she spent, she was three years there, almost died, like a number of her family and uh, who almost died and mm -hmm. uh, got back, relocated. And then my, my folks met uh, a few years after she returned uh, as, my fa as my father more or less escaped uh, and, and headed uh, west sure. into, into germany yeah so your father um i learned participated in a course through the famous artist school he dropped it when he got sick and you, you also suggest that your mother was super supportive of the idea that's that sarcastic dropped, that, yes uh, absolutely yeah uh as a, and i just got a uh, it's funny when i posted that and then 
um, the Rockwell was doing an exhibition on that famous artist school. And then I went to look for the, those, uh, those art books that my father had mm -hmm. that I still kept, that he still kept after he folded up shop, after he got sick and, and, and stopped studying. And it wasn't, it was the one in, there was another one in Minneapolis. So this wasn't the one that was, uh, out of, I guess, Connecticut or something. Right. This was, this was the one out of Minneapolis. And so he folded that up and, uh, pretty much gave up on, on this, his, his own dream of being a, a commercial artist. At that time, he didn't call them illustrators, or I right. guess they didn't refer to themselves as illustrators. They referred to, to themselves as commercial artists. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he put whatever he had stored and, and collected uh, into a, uh, a suitcase, and that was up in the attic. And uh, over the years, as a kid, I would sneak up there, and I'd go through his, his lesson books, and I'd see his drawings, I'd see the, the corrections. Mm -hmm. and somewhere in that, that kind of probably stuck with me. Right. Regardless of what I may have fantasized about. By the way, if I was a truck driver, I can't even back up in a, in a regular Honda SUV. So <laughs> uh, it would have been a horror show. But... Uh, <laughs> Somewhere, regardless of my fantasies, my my blue collar fantasies, there was this element of of uh, draw, you know, wanting to wanting to do this as well. Yeah, yeah. So I was always drawing, even as a kid. Right. By the time you know grade school comes and you're doing silly drawings or comic uh, comic heroes and stuff like that for the other uh, kids in class and stuff, um, and and uh, then you get to high school and you're starting to do all that other work. Yep. This might surprise a few listeners. It might even upset a few listeners. But one of the largest supporters and commissioners of illustration for more than 150 years is none other than the United States Armed Forces. Winslow Homer was embedded with troops during the Civil War. His reportage, or I guess it's pronounced reportage if you live in a big city, um, appeared in Harper's Weekly. In yeah, other they words, were called, they were called specials back then. Sure. That but, was their title, specials. Right. So in other words, there's a long intertwining history between illustration and the military. The Society of Illustrators is a partner with the U.S. Air Force, and it's been, been the case since the 50s. Illustrators, if I may, who either drew while serving or drew for the military as a civilian include... James Montgomery Flagg, who's famous for doing the I Want You Uncle Sam poster, Bill Keen, creator of Family Circus, Maurice Noble, who was a famous animator for Warner Brothers, Noble's commanding officer during World War II was Theodore Geisel, otherwise known as Dr. Seuss, Stan Lee was also part of the Army's Signal Corps, uh, so was Charles Adams, creator of the Adams Family comic, and then obviously the TV show and movies. World War II veterans credit Bill Malden's Willie and Joe comic for getting them through the horrors of the war. Uh, Ashley Bryan, the famous children's book creator who stormed the beaches of Normandy. I mean, like you, Victor, you too drew soldiers on the war front. I mean, I can go on and on with this stuff. Like Peggy Fortnum, who illustrated Paddington Bear, fought Nazis for the British. Ronald Cyril drew his captors during his time as a POW at the Changi prison camp. E.H. Shepard was a, a war correspondent, fought and visually documented the war front during World War I. Linda Kitson, who was a war correspondent uh, during the Falklands War, she was the first woman to be embedded with troops I mean, it's like, and I'm barely scraping the surface, right? So, oh yeah, think of Harvey Dunn. Think of that whole group of of early Society of Illustrators members. Sure. In in World War One, who went with the uh, Expeditionary Force, uh, uh, and 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 uh, documented their their activities. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very long, very deep. I mean, you name an illustrator who's lived, you know, <clears throat> around World War One or two. Chances are pretty excellent that they've or Vietnam or onward, chances are excellent that they've, uh, you know, done something with or for the military. Right. Um, right. Through the Troops First Foundation, you drew soldiers on the front lines in Kuwait and Iraq. You were embedded in Kandahar with a medic team recovering wounded soldiers. So all of that is a lead up to this one question for you. What's it like drawing the troops? 
Um, many of the artists that you just uh, mentioned were actual uh, com combatants themselves. They ser they served in the military. Right. I've never ser served in the military. I've uh, been a civilian, mm -hmm. and and I think that's something that uh, it makes for a, a little bit of a, 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 of a difference. Sure. I'm going to start. I'm going to start umming and eyeing here as I'm trying to think, uh, phrase this out properly. And um, so, from my standpoint, I go there as a civilian observer, as a witness. We we call it witness art, uh, in one sense. Right. And I'm I'm looking at uh, at what's transpiring in front of me not as a, a combatant, not as someone who's uh, aware of all the um, hardware and tactics and, and such like that. I'm looking for other things, uh, whether I'm actually in a frontline situation, and I've only really been on a frontline situation twi tw tw twice, Hmm. Once really, and and uh, in 2019, I was uh, in back in Kuwait and Iraq with uh, the Marine Corps, but by that time things had pretty much uh, quieted down. So uh, I was n I was not uh, in in any great sense of uh, being in harm. Certainly, when I was in in uh, Afghanistan in 2000. 11 with the dust off unit that was a little bit more of a, of a tricky situation mm -hmm. and even then compared to some of my uh fellow uh, combat artists my situation was not as dire as some of them uh experienced in the in their in their embeds right but it's not like you were at disneyland or anything i mean no, it was still no. perilous that, it, or at it, least had the had the uh there was the chance of it yeah, yeah. There's always that chance, right. and uh, so and there were a couple of opportunities to maybe not come back in one piece. Uh, but uh, mine was kind of like on the the PG uh, side of it. Uh, I get that, but you're you're with them. You're like with them there. You're not like in your basement. Do you know what I'm saying? No. Yeah. No. Okay. So therefore, when I'm there, I'm looking at the interactions. I'm trying to pick up on on the human connection. When I first got involved with the Air Force art program through the Society of Illustrators, I was pretty much upfront about my my mission, which was not to uh, draw hardware, not to draw planes and, and um, trucks and technical equipment and things like that. That's, uh, there were so many uh, great artists who could uh, paint jets and planes and and helicopters and all that wonderful stuff and do it like why would you even want to uh, compete with that my influences were more people like howard brody mm -hmm. uh, who was a, a mentor of mine who was a friend of mine um, i got to become friends with him uh, during the john hinckley trial when we were working in the courtroom and um Howard had had a huge effect on me, but also there was another great artist, uh, Kerr Eby, uh, who was with the Marines in the Pacific Theater, and who eventually, uh, af not long after the war, died of many of the diseases that he had picked up in the Pacific. Both of those artists, for me, were all about the human connection, mm -hmm. the, about documenting the boots on the ground, of showing the the uh, personal. Uh, turmoil uh, uh, that was going on with the soldiers or Marines that they were uh, with, that mm -hmm. they were embedded with. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to tell, that, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of narrative uh, documentation. How did the troops respond to you? Well, initially, they're so used to photographers uh, hovering around them that it was very strange that somebody's bringing sketch pads and <laughs> And not just coming in, clicking some pictures, and then uh, uh, disappearing. Right. I mean, you're you're there with them, and you're not going away. You're just drawing them. So you develop that trust, you develop that rapport, and you get to get into that at least a, a little bit into that interior world. Sure. I mean, were they not to assume that they you know never seen an artist in their lives, but you know, 
in your circle throughout your career in my circle throughout my career i've seen a heck of a lot of artists more so than you know i would assume your average soldier um maybe that's just, maybe that's not a good assumption i don't know but did were they were they sort of like you're an artist you're a working artist did they, they did they question any of that or were they no they didn't question yeah. it they, they uh actually they once I mentioned I work, like worked for Rolling Stone, I said, "Oh, really? Wow! Yeah, it's like so cool." And I'm I'm thinking I'm going to get hung by saying that, but uh, on the contrary, it was like I never got a negative response. It was like, "Wow, that's really sharp." And of course, the funny thing is they would constantly refer to what I was doing as taking pictures, or, uh, <laughs> or he's got he's got some great photographs here, uh, and uh, so. <laughs> their their terminology uh, on many occasions was was incorrect, but right. they. They got the i. They certainly had the idea down about what I was doing and what I was there for. Yeah. And of course, and the bottom line is, once they saw what you were drawing and and, and the fact that they had been documented, now they're part of the historical record, and it's like um, such an affirmation of of their contribution, mm -hmm. of their sacrifice. You might want to say, mm -hmm. uh, of their of what they. Uh, uh, of their of the acknowledgement, let's put it that way, of acknowledging uh, of what they are there to do. Sure, that is that's indescribable in many uh, respects as to how that impacts them. You just uh, you you know though that uh, they are very appreciative of that acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of them don't think that they're they're getting um, a. F <sighs> the kind of attention that they want. You know, I don't think a lot of them really, right. you talk to enough and you, you, you realize that a lot of them are not really wild about that. Thank you for your service. You know, the, your yeah. service is, is something that you volunteered for. It's not even like you were drafted. This is stuff that they were, this is what they, this was there as my meditation teacher would say, this is their Dharma. You know, uh, uh, this is what they, the, the calling in their life. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, so you're 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 acknowledging that, and they're uh, and they're grateful for that. Right. Are you familiar with the illustrator Miriam Troop? I should be. I'm I'm bad on names, uh, much better on visuals. Um, she, you know, working artist, uh, doing a lot of portraiture. Uh, she did portraits of a lot of really famous people. Alan Hirschfeld being one of them. Um, she worked with the USO. She went overseas with the USO um, in 1953 during the Korean War, and she was embedded among enlisted men in the in the hills. Uh, why? Because they couldn't send photographers. It was too much, it was too difficult to send a bunch of equipment up there, but you could easily send a, an artist with a sketchbook up there. Um, so she and seven other illustrators met, I guess, with the USO, the society, and volunteered. And uh, yes. she okay. she sent back um, the drawings that she had done of the troops were sent back to their families, and they wrote letters back to her, um, sharing with her how appreciative they were of that, mm -hmm. acknowledging and, their existence. You know what I mean? Which is kind of something. This is what I was. This was really my function with the troops first foundation. Uh, when I went over there, I was going with a bunch of uh, uh, sports celebrities. Who were doing meet and greets and maybe some uh, quick uh, clinics with the? Uh, they were basically golfers, so mm. they were doing quick. I was amazed at how many golf sets were over there uh, <laughs> on base. I mean, and then they do these clinics and and yeah, that's uh, cool. And but I was there to draw, and I was doing all these portraits as well. Mm -hmm. And what I would uh, at the end of the portrait, I'd say, uh, "Who'd you like to have this uh, sent to?" And I'd either get sometimes sometimes it was the the uh, the, the subject and uh, himself or herself would would want it, but most of the time it was like you know send it to mom, dad, my yeah. wife, my kids, or whatever. Yeah. And uh, I got home and I, I scanned all the artwork and I uh, sent them out to all the addresses that were provided. And since we were doing like those Thanksgiving week tours. Mm -hmm. The uh, finishes were always sent out to the families before Christmas time, and yes, you did. You would get those responses yeah. from from the families. Yeah, yeah. Um, you won a gold medal for that effort from the Society of Illustrators. Somewhere along that line, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is there? A, I mean, 
I'm sure that experience, those multiple experiences, led to a number of observations, revelations, insight, wisdom, whatever you want to call it. Um, what's one lesson that you can draw, no pun intended, um, from your work there, from your work with the military? Be be open to being surprised. Be uh, Have your... Um preconceived notions turned upside down. I think that's been always part of whenever I've gone anywhere, if I've gone to a hospital uh, with the Joe Bonham project to, uh, to draw the, 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 the seriously wounded mm-hmm. uh, when I've gone just on these, uh, these tours, like with Tro- troops first, when I've done work with the air force or the, uh, with the Marines, just mm-hmm. embedding, embedding either in the, on the home front uh, uh, during training missions and things like that, or overseas, uh, like I did in 2019. Be very conscious of, of uh, and be very open to the idea of being surprised. And one of the things I, uh, that's, and I'm not a great talker, I'm not a very loquacious person, uh, unless maybe a, a couple drinks happen. But, <laughs> doing, uh, a pretty good, doing a pretty good job so far. Did, are, did, well, you, did you have a couple drinks before this? No, no, it's too <laughs> early. Uh, and I, I got to say, I was wondering about how I was going to comport myself, but um, nah, you're doing great. Um, be quiet. Uh, you don't have to ask. You don't have to do a lot of talking. Just uh, all you have to do is ask a few questions. You'll get conversations, and if not. Just sit back and listen. The conversations are always always happening. Mm-hmm. There were some drawings that uh, when we uh, spent time at the the towers, the guard towers, and and uh, at certain bases, mm-hmm. and you just sit there. And you there was almost to a location. There was the alpha conversation list of the two guards up in the tower, and then there was the straight man who just basically listened and nodded and offered very little. Uh, <laughs> Very little response. And sure. we joked. Uh, I joked about this with, with uh, a couple of the other, other artists, uh, former st- uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Elise McKelvey, who was in the Marine Corps, and she's out now. But we were joking about that. We said, God, you know, every one we go to, there's one who's just talking all the time, and the other, <laughs> and the uh, and the other uh, Marine who's just uh, sitting quietly and listening, and yeah. that, that that nod of the head. So you, if you're to fly on the wall. And not in a sneaky way. You're just there, and you're just listening, and you're doing your job, which is drawing. You hear such an amazing spectrum of of observations and commentary that any easy kind of stereotyping of of the military gets gets put to rest pretty quickly. Yep. And uh, you'll have hard asses. You'll also have incredibly uh, left, left of center, shockingly left of center, mm-hmm. and some, some very uh, upfront, frank uh, observations on what the military, uh, what, what their role in the military or what their role in the world is. Right. Over the years, uh, since 1974, you've, your work has found its way onto pages and into projects from Time, Newsweek, The Wall Street Journal, Esquire, GQ, The Washington Post, HarperCollins, Ogilvy and Mather, Procter and Gamble, and that is like, again, scratching the surface. Several of these, you know, gigs that you've had are long running, years long running. Um, You mentioned the Rolling Stone. In 2008, you illustrated the cover of Rolling Stone. It was your first one You called it a very noteworthy career milestone. Nine years later, you illustrated the now famous Rolling Stone cover of Trump as a tornado. The design director, Joe Hutchinson, said you came in and brainstormed ideas around until you landed on something that would work for Matt Taibbi's piece. I'll add a side note to this for listeners who are in the, you know, traditional media is dead camp. You did this piece it appears to me in colored pencil. Yes. For, first, I have a few questions. One, you were mentioning earlier in the conversation about how you were you went to the New York Times and created the piece piece on site. You kind of did the same thing here, except with a brainstorming session. So, a couple a couple questions. One, did you get any hate mail for that cover? No, no. Really. Um, unlike some of my um, 
compatriots, uh, I have gotten very few, I'm not encouraging it either, but I've gotten very few uh, hate comments. Huh. Very few. Okay. Because, I mean, there's a lot of um, talking about left of center, a little bit more left of left of center kind of like political positioning with your with your work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Not to say it's bad or anything. I'm just saying that I would I would assume that you'd get at least some, you know, MAGA types coming at you. No, it's it's weird. Uh, and I'm and I'm grateful for it, too. I, I really don't need the hassle. Uh, <laughs> I, I, no one does. No, no one does. But I, I feel like some of my colleagues kind of welcome it, which is I, I, don't, I don't understand why. OK, um, so for this cover I've, and really any piece you've done literally since the beginning, how do you know when you're done? Like, are, how, are you ever done with any illustration, even personal stuff? Like, how do you know when to stop? Um, or do you just stop because of, you know? deadlines or just because you feel like it i mean what's to you know how do you know when an illustrated when an illustration is finished sometimes it's a, it's a total gut reaction where this is it all right that's it and you stop other times it becomes more of a technical observation that for me because i'm not uh of a i don't lean towards super completion uh, or or super rendering right so when i feel like i'm starting to get into the uh the the, the minutia of a piece mm -hmm. that's when i'm thinking okay not a good idea uh we we really now you're just overthinking this for what for for your mission all right mm -hmm. you're overthinking this other illustrators for other illustrators um it's it's perfectly fine to get into the minutia and and get into the get into the the the, the rendering, mm -hmm. because it, it's 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 their look, it's what they do, it's what they're they're being hired to do. Mm -hmm. For me, I think it's more like the concept, and then just do it as uh, do a really good job, but don't go off course, don't start making it what it's not. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question because I think it does. I've, I, I've, been, I've been thinking about that a lot, uh, and and I find myself constantly asking that question. Okay, you know, you could sit here and spend the next two days. You're two days ahead of schedule, but why? Why do you need to add anything more? Uh, it's 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 what it is. Mm -hmm. That famous portrait, not comparing myself at all, but that famous Velasquez portrait of his, his servant. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, I mean, he stopped at a certain point. It's, it's, it's bravura painting. But I, I sometimes wonder when I, uh, about a painting like that, did he stop because he said, that's all I need to say? Or was he tempted to say, you know, if I go into the eyes and I really start shading in the the, the, the lids a little more, will that make it a better painting? Um, I, I tend to lean more toward the immediate response. And I know I'm or, or always, almost always, sinking an illustration when I'm past that sensation of immediate response and am um, going into finessing it right i think you're right i think you're right i i, I mean who, who knows obviously he's not the last guy is not here but i i just think that illustrators these days or at least the ones that i talk to and i talk to a lot of them overthink they they default to overthinking and i just don't know if if you know velazquez and them did that they they knew where they wanted to go they went there Made it, they made an adjustment here and there, and that was it. And they moved on. They didn't really – weren't really worried about how it's going to look on Instagram or anything. You know what I mean? I think I, – I just wonder if, like, since we're now so so much part of this global society of illustrators, um, that that kind of thing has now affected our own ability to trust our damn selves. Do you know what I mean? I don't think I've ever trusted myself. Um but I've all, but I've gotten better over the years in being able to turn off that 
lack of uh, that that less trust or that uh, a desire to second guess. Yeah, I don't think I've gotten. I don't. I certainly haven't gotten rid of it. I'm always uh, second guessing, but the, I think I'm responding better the older I get. Uh, maybe I'll even get it get it down to perfection by the time I die. But uh, uh, you'll say, but, "Oh my God, I got it!" And then that's that's your last sentence. Here's the fun thing. Can I go back to uh, what we were talking about in, in terms of? Uh, when I was in that, the office with Rolling Stone, when we came up with that, um, sure. that uh, cover co- concept, that was what I so loved about that experience. And we've kind of done it now a number of times, ironically, during this COVID period, where you've got these Zoom sessions going on with the, with the art directors and the editors, uh, and uh, with Joe and, and Toby and, and uh, Jason and Sean and stuff like that. And you're... You're uh, you're on the Zoom, and I'm scribbling as we're talking and kicking things back and forth. But when I when I was given that opportunity to do that that second cover, mm-hmm. up, uh, and it was we had no we had no idea we had really Matt was still writing the story. I I was still we still had an apartment in the city at that time. I said, guys, guys, wait, whoa, 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 why are we going to try to do this back and forth on on uh, email? Let me just stop over to your offices. This was so old school. This was like when I was illustrating in the 70s, mm-hmm. maybe into the 80s. You sat down with the art director. You just were kicking around ideas more often than not in the office, mm-hmm. maybe and, and scribbling it up. And and then you went home and and or back to the studio and mm-hmm. and and uh, brought them to finish. So we got I got there and we I brought some pads, brought some pencils. And we were just scribbling away and we we're just kicking things. And there's something that is so irreplaceable about being in direct contact with the art director and that that immediacy of the of the give and take so that you're actually having those quantum jumps that if you were just by yourself, either won't happen mm-hmm. or will take forever. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, you're just kind of flailing away with failed ideas. Right. There's something about, you know, somebody says a word, somebody has a thought which triggers off something else, which brings you to a much better idea than what you had before. Ironically, that tornado was probably one of the first ideas when I sat down and was talking. And then we kept going on and on and just uh, seeing if we could push it in, in any number of directions. And, and as it turned out, it was, it became the tornado. Yeah. Again, you, that's a that's a, that's a, that's a first thought, and there's something that uh, needs to be said to students is that, uh, or people just starting out, trust that first impulse, a lot a lot more than you might want to give it uh, credit. Right. I mean, doesn't that go back to like trusting your own judgment, trusting yourself? Yeah. Being more trustful of your instincts. I mean, I think I think so many hurdles that get that illustrators face on their path paths to uh to their goals is placed before them by them because of that lack of trust in themselves i i i feel that way um you said in the 80s that that whole like collaboration on-site collaboration with art directors died i've talked to a lot of illustrators who've worked in the you know 40s 50s 60s 70s into the 80s into the 90s and for the most part i think maybe i think each of them all kind of lament the fact that you that 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 time is gone but you know it's not like i mean things change like, you know we get it things change you have to adapt um what are your thoughts i mean do you feel like being an illustrator today is better or worse harder easier than it was back in the 70s i mean what is your take on the current health of illustration <sighs> I'm probably not the best person in the world to talk to about that because I, I live up in the woods at this point and I'm I'm kind of cut off from a lot of the day-to-day activity. Even when before COVID, I was my wife and I were living up in the woods here. So uh, I think that more than anything else, the big name, the the, the big thrust, the big emphasis is on promotion and self-promotion. Mm-hmm. 
and and just working that social media angle uh, incessantly. I don't know if I, I'm not necessarily cut out for that. I, I just realized uh, I posted a, uh, something on, on my Instagram page, uh, a quick drawing I did of, of Mozart. But uh, I, and that was because I I hadn't done anything in a while. Mm-hmm. I hadn't posted anything. Right. And uh, I have some of my colleagues and this is where the, the comparison and the second guessing comes in. Some of my colleagues were posting like two, three, four drawings a day. Mm-hmm. And uh, constantly on, 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 in that public eye, in a sense. Sure. And you, th- you think to yourself, I think to myself, that, okay, so you're really a, a lazy slob. You, you, you are just such an underperformer, underachiever. Uh, why are you not uh, waking up and already drawing? Why are you not going to bed with the pencil in your hand? And... Uh, I don't know. Is it? Uh, I can't say I'm any, that much older than a number of my colleagues who do, who are constantly seem to be just riveted to the uh, to their sketch pads or or, or the drawing table. But uh, I, I feel that at times, uh, kind of, I, sort of a guilt, sort of a guilt. Uh, and then at the same time, it goes back to disciplining myself to to well, what was my, what's my mission? And when I draw, when I want to draw. I'll draw, uh, and and I do love to draw. Drawing is drawing is really my foundation. I'm I'm not. I don't think of myself as a great designer. I don't think of myself as a great colorist or or or, or painter. Yeah. I'd say in the last ten years, I've been feeling that significant shift away from standard illustration and more towards having fun drawing. So whereas 45 years ago or 40 years ago or 30 years ago, I was working maybe 24 seven as, a, as a, and a lot of that time was spent as a single parent, mm-hmm. um, taking a, every job that was available. So in a sense, I was drawing all the time, but I wasn't necessarily having fun. I was paying, I was doing jobs to pay bills. And, and keep the family functioning and, and, and moving along. And as I got, oh, as I got, as we empty nested it and I had more time and this was around the time things started happening with the, with the Air Force art program, I was, I was able to go on missions. Mm-hmm. I was able to go away and not have to worry about uh, being at home. And my wife, Terry, uh, she said, now you finally, now you're at the point where you want it to be for the past couple of decades and yeah. take advantage of that yeah. and, not, uh, and, and do and start exploring that. And I did. So my career at this point is a lot less clients. I don't, uh, though that multitude has, has uh, dwindled significantly, but the work, almost every job I do now is, is a job that I enjoy doing. Right. Cause you've built to that. Is that kind of what you think? Well, I also got, I think I got edited out of the process too. What I have to offer, I think in a lot of ways is not necessarily what is current or what is, um, most appealing. Sure. You know, um, okay. I was trying to go for, I was trying to go for a more positive, uh, take on that. Um, but yeah, well, maybe, maybe it's it, a little bit of both. Maybe it's a little bit of both. It's, it's not a negative. It's a rea- it's reality. It's, it's, it's looking at it, uh, very objectively and saying, um, I'm doing what I want to, I'm doing at this point in my life, what I want to do. And I'm having an awful lot of fun doing it. Mm-hmm. And, um, so if I get to do something for Rolling Stone or the nation, um, this is great. All I'm being asked to do is draw. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I wanted to do 45, 47 years right. ago. I mean, and that's, you know? and that's, that's why so many illustrators go through the shit uh, for so many years, because I mean, there isn't, there are very few jobs that are as appealing or as romantic or as interesting to artists that than just being paid to draw. I mean, how amazing is that? And so I, I think illustrators are willing to take some serious hits for a very long time to get to that point. And, and it, it pains me to see so many illustrators having to struggle. The struggle part sucks a ton. And I, and I, I wish it wasn't as hard as it is. That's all. 
the struggle part sucks. Um, and at the same time, as Stephen Pressfield would say, the struggle or, or somebody like Ryan Holiday would say, uh, the, the struggle is part of the process. Yeah, I know. And, and, and uh, it's not necessarily fun. Yeah. Giuseppe, when we graduated Parsons, one of the things that we were told quite often by our instructors was that within the first two years of graduation, there would be like an 85 percent uh, attrition rate on the, on the graduates mm -hmm. who, who, who made it into the business. And now, does that mean that the, the ones who succeeded are the ones who, who, whose work is the best or was it the or in, in certain respects are they the ones who persisted? Are they the ones who found a niche, a niche, a niche? Uh, I'm not <laughs> yeah, it's like me for reportage or reportage. Yeah, I just don't know. So, right. Um, if they're lucky enough that they can, they have some um, publications or outlets that are, are publishing their work, mm -hmm. and they can develop in that. That's 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 a for, that's a great bit of fortune. Sure. There are not that many superstars that I can think of. We have some extraordinary ones. You've interviewed uh, a number of them. Mm -hmm. this is, here's a question I wanted to ask. It's not even planned. Um, I don't have it in my notes, but um, I feel like I need to acknowledge it. You mentioned COVID. You know, we're talking about struggle. We're talking about loss and all that kind of thing. Um, when your first wife passed, did did art help you at all? Like, were you did you rely on it? Did you lean on it? Did you abandon it? I mean, you you found yourself as a single parent. I mean, you just said yourself you had to pay some bills and whatnot. I mean, yeah. How did how did the illustration play a part there, or did it? It played a part in the sense that it was um, it was my life. I had three kids, I had three sons, and and uh, they were they were still like five three and, uh, and one and a half and um mm. you, there was no option all right there was no option to fall into a kind of state of disrepair and uh i remember when my first my wife uh, my late wife was first diagnosed and i mentioned it to uh, i told bernie deandria and bernie's comment his immediate comment was whatever you do don't stop working it's you're going to need to work and not to, to make money. You're just going to need to work to stay somewhat focused, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, um, he, Bernie was kind of uh, very, uh, <laughs> he was very dramatic. So he was, when he said it, it was like, you've got, you've got to stay. Just remember Vic, you've got to keep working Yeah. no matter what. And, and I think it, it, it sustained me. Yeah. It didn't, but it didn't. Uh, it, it didn't save me. Let's put it that way. Sure. There, it was more a situation where there was no option. All right. Yeah. Um, and which is good. Sometimes it's really good not to have an option, and just to be uh, take what what's in front of you, and, and barrel ahead with it. Oh yeah, been there. Um, let's remember. Let's remember that. Uh, there are definitely some illustrators listening to this conversation. What would be one piece of advice that you'd like to share with them before you and I sign off? I usually do do about two or three of those, but, and one of them I mentioned before, like trust your instincts. Mm -hmm. uh, the, for that first thought that comes to your head might very likely be the, uh, the one that uh, is going to be the best yeah. regardless of what you do later on. However, I think one of the things, and that, this comes up in both drawing, in the matter, just in the matter of drawing, it also comes up in the matter of, of working on assignments. And for students, uh, for students, it's also very important. Uh, I've, I've done enough talks at school. I said, this, the, this is the opportunity to fuck up right here. Go, go big and fail big because you'll learn way more from that. Uh, in terms of being a pro, no one to throw a, uh, a, a f something that's totally feeling like a fail, no matter how much you're trying to force it to work, uh, recognize when it's a fail and be willing to throw it away and start all over again. Uh, because it's A, very liberating, 
as frustrating as it might be from the standpoint of uh, maybe a deadline or whatever, mm -hmm. throw it away. Throw it away. Say, yes, this is not working. It's not looking good. And start again because chances are you have now absorbed basically everything that you did wrong on that first attempt. Uh, and now you're, you, it'll be happening a lot faster on the second go around because you've already edited out a lot of the, of the fails yeah. uh, that, that, that went into the first one. I think it's really liberating to just uh, give up on, uh, or ne that's not a good term because that, that has really negative connotations, but admit when something's not working yeah. and just start all over again. To learn more about Victor, visit uhasillustration.com. If you enjoyed our conversation, please share it with your friends, subscribe to the podcast, and provide a positive rating and review. Become a patron by visiting patreon.com slash illustration D-E-P-T. In return, you'll receive our soft enamel pin, a reusable discount code for 10% off, and access to patron-only episodes we're calling Extra Credit. This podcast is produced by the Illustration Department, a global leader in online education for illustrators. Visit us at illustrationdept.com for class offerings, testimonials, the alumni showcase, the podcast show notes, our forum, the bookshop, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.